How's it going, everybody? I am driving currently, so we're going to have this conversation as if you are a passenger in my van sitting next to me, only you're kind of in front of me. So if I'm not looking at the camera all the time, that is why. So just pretend that you're on this little road trip with me and you're just sitting in the passenger seat. We are going to talk about sensory input. You probably only care about this if you have um, a brain injury, but it's actually important if you have any other kind of injury as well. Um, it's also important because you're a human and it is applicable to everybody, but if it doesn't directly apply to you, you probably don't wanna to listen to this unless you're a big nerd, which I am. So I made a post, I think it was today, maybe yesterday, talking about how I am planning to do a little bit of gravel riding on my bike because it's easier on the brain than riding technical mountain bike trails because there is less sensory input. And I got a few questions about that and a couple comments from people and then a comment from somebody saying that um, that trails actually have less sensory input than busy roads. Um, and I think that person misunderstood what I was saying because busy roads most definitely have a lot of sensory input. I was specifically referring to quiet roads and I apologize for not making that explicitly clear in my post. Um, but I thought it'd be a good opportunity to jump on here and just chat a little bit about sensory input and what it is and why it matters. So what qualifies me to talk about sensory input? Um, I think all of you know that I had a concussion last year and I've been on this journey of trying to heal my brain for a year now. Um, so personal experience. Also, I am a doctor of physical therapy and in my practice, I specialize in what's called neuromuscular re-education, which essentially is um, helping people retrain their brain and their body to talk to each other after an injury. And that can be a brain injury, but it doesn't have to be. That can be any type of injury. Or it doesn't even have to be an injury. Our brains and our bodies can have impaired communication, even if we don't have a physical injury, just based on different movement patterns that we've developed throughout our lives because of our work, because of our sports, all sorts of things. We can develop movement patterns that could potentially injure us. And it's through using neuromuscular re-education that I help teach people how to use their brains to connect with their bodies to help them move with better alignment. So that's essentially what I do in the majority of my physical therapy practice. So um, I'm certainly not a neurosurgeon or a neuroscientist, but I do know a lot about brains uh, just because of where I've chosen to specialize in my career. So sensory input is exactly what it sounds like. It is input from the outside world, generally, it can be from the inside world too, but generally right now we're speaking to input from the outside world that we are taking in through our senses. So that can be our sight, our smell, our hearing, our taste, and our touch. We also have a sense called proprioception, which is essentially our knowledge and ability to feel where our body is in space and where our different parts of our body are in space when we can't see them, when our eyes are closed. So if you were to close your eyes and hold your hand out here, right? Proprioception would tell you that your hand is out in front of your face and slightly to the right side of your head if you've got your eyes closed. And the way that we feel proprioception, one of the ways is through sensory fibers in our muscles, in our joints. Um, and 
if we are doing something like riding a mountain bike, we get proprioceptive input from our hands on the bars and our feet on the pedals and our butt on the seat if we are sitting. So that can impact our balance and our coordination, among other things. But proprioception is super important. So when it comes to talking about sensory input in terms of rehabilitating an injury, as a physical therapist, if somebody comes to me and they have, you know, say a knee injury, okay, say that someone has torn their ACL and they've had surgery and they're coming to me for rehabilitation after the surgery. So when they would start doing exercises, we start with the most simple activities partially because the sensory input that is going to be coming at that person as they're doing their exercise and their activity is going to impact that person's ability to perform the exercise correctly. And potentially, if there's too much sensory input being thrown at them when they're performing the activity, they could potentially re-injure their knee. So, for example, say that the person has come a little ways along in their rehab and they are working on a simple single leg balancing activity. The way that we would start that is having the person stand on one leg on a level surface, so like a hard floor. And they would have their eyes open so they can use their, their visual sense. And we keep it pretty simple. There's not a lot of distractions around. Their foot is on a solid surface and all they have to do is think about balance and now when I'm retraining somebody because I specialize in neuromuscular re-education I would then tell that person to put their brain inside their foot and feel that their foot is standing on the ground equally weighted between three points on the foot so the big toe side and the little toe side of the ball of the foot and the center of the heel so like on a triangle right and I would have that person sense with their brain how it feels to have their foot on the ground in that position and I might also have them rock slightly forward onto the ball of their foot and then sense with their brain how it feels to be more on the ball of their foot I might actually have them say I have more weight on the ball of my foot to really anchor that in. And then I might have them shift their weight back to the heel and even say, I have more weight on the heel of my foot. And then find the center again, feel it with their brain and say, I am centered on my foot, right? So this is retraining that proprioception. Now, the reason that that's important for a healing knee is because as the person continues to do more and more complex activities and movements, it's going to give that person a much greater likelihood of staying healthy and not re-injuring as they're doing those complex movements because that person is gonna have a better sense of balance and coordination and positioning when they're doing those complex movements. Hope that makes sense. So then as the person continues to progress, we are going to increase the sensory input, right? So instead of having them stand on a hard floor, they might stand on a folded up yoga mat or a pillow. Now they have an uneven surface. And so it's going to be harder. It's gonna challenge that proprioception a lot more and therefore challenge their balance and their coordination if they have to balance on one foot standing on a pillow. It all of a sudden becomes a lot harder, right? Now, as we progress them again, we might also start throwing tennis balls at them. And so now they have to catch tennis balls while standing on a pillow, balancing on one foot, okay? So this is challenging for all the muscles and the tendons and, and everything surrounding the knee, but it's also challenging that person's brain, right? And physical therapy, even for an injured knee, also involves the brain because it's really important in neuromuscular re-education, which we all need if we're gonna be com uh, performing complex activities, which we all do in our lives, it's really important that the brain is involved in the rehab so that the connection between the brain and the body, especially the, bo the part of the body that's been injured, can rewire and become healthy and functional again, all right? So 
talking about a concussion or a brain injury, it's the actual brain that is injured. And there's a lot of systems, even, even after the brain tissue itself heals, there are a lot of systems involved um, in concussion and in post-concussion syndrome. And I'm not gonna go into all that because that's not what this is about, but it's the same idea with sensory input. So when I was referring to um, biking on a gravel road, being more friendly to the brain than mountain biking on a technical trail, this is why. So imagine that you are riding a bicycle and bicycling is providing more sensory input than walking already because you've got proprioceptive input coming through the handlebars and the seat and the pedals, right? Instead of just walking, having it coming through your feet on the ground. So you've got input from the pedals, input from the handlebars, input from the saddle. If you're riding on a technical trail or even just like a rough trail, just an uneven trail, not even really technical, all of that input is also going to be amplified by the, the bumps and the corners and the dips and the divots and all of the things that happen on a trail. So all of those little things that you don't think about normally, that actually does amplify the sensory input coming into your brain. Now this doesn't happen when you're riding on a road. So whether that's pavement or whether that's smooth gravel, just in that you have a lot less sensory input coming in through proprioception, through your hands, through your feet, through your saddle. So that's one thing. Another thing is visual, right? So think about riding on a trail and I'm, I'm imagining, I'm headed to Arizona, so I'm imagining trails in Flagstaff that I recently rode. We've got trees, we've got rocks, we've got bushes, we've got potentially other riders, we've got animals potentially darting around, little chipmunks and everything. We've got roots, uh, we've got all this stuff on the trail in front of us, but then we've also got these things on the side of the trail. And we've got this small brown ribbon that we have to stay on. Uh, and likely we're going pretty fast. And even if we're not going super fast, we're going fast enough to keep the momentum needed to keep the bike rolling, right? So we have some speed. And all of these obstacles are forms of sensory input coming into our visual system, all right? Now, when we are riding on a road, if it's a busy road, if we're, say we're riding in town or something like that, or riding on a busy road where there's cars coming by, obviously there's a lot of sensory input in the form of sound, right? Now, at least for me, and this is, this is where like everybody's a little bit different because some people with their brain injuries, you know, sound bothers them more. And some people like visual stimulation bothers them more. And you know, some people, it's very, it's different with everybody, right? Like what senses are more difficult for you to process. But, so when you're on a road or when you're in a city, if it's busy, you've got a lot more sensory input coming to you from sound. You probably also have a lot more coming from sight, right? So um, you've got those two. However, again, when you're on the road, you don't have as much proprioceptive input coming in from the actual surface that you're biking on. So you kind of have to balance that, right? Like, what do you have more trouble with? And if you're not really sure, if you haven't been able to discern if you have more sensory deficits in vision versus proprioception uh, or whatever, you can just think about in general, right? So in general, obviously, single track trail that is rough or technical, lots of sensory input a road that's busy with cars or lots of like man-made stimulation around you, um, obviously lots of input, right? So quiet gravel road out in the country or maybe like even a little four-wheel drive road that's not super rough and technical, um, not a lot of sensory input, right? Like we've got a, a wide track, essentially. We don't have to try to follow a narrow single track. So that is less sensory input trying to visualize and direct our bicycle onto that narrow trail. And we don't have as many obstacles coming at us. The surface underneath us is more level. So we don't have that proprioceptive input. Um, ideally it's quiet, so we don't have as much input that is um, sound-based. 
and it's also quiet visually. So that is what I mean when I refer to, you know, riding on a quiet road being easier on the brain than riding on a trail. Now, you might have a trail that is super mellow, that might be really wide, that might be really smooth, that, you know, doesn't have a lot of obstacles around for your peripheral visual field to have to process and for your proprioceptive system to have to process through the bars and the pedals in the seat. Um, and it might be quiet. You might have that. That's great if you do. That's definitely a great resource for anybody who is trying to get back on the bike after a brain injury. Um, but if you don't have that, you know, just think about the resources that you have. Think about the places that you have available to you to ride. And just think about the input to your senses in all of those places. So think about like what's coming at you visually, what is coming into your ears. Um, you're probably not really tasting much on a bike ride. You're probably just eating food you would normally eat. So that's probably not much of a factor. Smells. Um, I guess if you're in a really stinky city, you could have a lot of smell input. Um, <laughs> I don't know a lot of people that ride in stinky cities, but there are people out there that do that. Uh, and let's see, vision, hearing, smelling, tasting, and then touching. Um, you know, what is the proprioceptive input? And that's, that's the one that most people don't think about is the input of where your bike tires are actually rolling over. And then think about that and then also think about like what your system has to do to process all of that input. So when you're on a trail, there's a lot more reaction that needs to happen from your body, AKA your brain, right? There's a lot more reaction that needs to happen in your brain after you process all that sensory information. Because if you're responding slowly, like you're probably going to fly off the trail and hit a tree, right? And your brain doesn't want you to fly off the trail and hit a tree. And so, because it's a situation that is a lot more dynamic and complex when you're riding on single track, it's necessary that the brain processes all that sensory input information really, really quickly and responds really, really quickly. So as you can probably imagine, that's pretty exhausting on a brain. Um, now, normal brains that aren't injured, usually no big deal, right? Um, but this is what everybody's brain does, right? So like if we're on our bike and we're putting out effort that's more than just soft pedaling, our brain has to regulate what our heart rate does, has to regulate what happens with our breathing rate or respiration, and then it has to regulate how our muscles fire and how our blood pumps through our body. It's regulating all of that stuff every time we raise our activity level past just lying in bed, right? The resting heart rate um, activity level. And so for somebody who has a concussion or a brain injury, even just that might be enough for them without all of the sensory input altogether, right? So when I first got my injury, I started with um, riding on a trainer inside because there was virtually no sensory input coming from riding on my trainer. And I could just start working on letting my brain relearn how to regulate, raising my heart rate and raising my rate of breathing and raising my muscle response to um, the increased activity. And then, going out into, you know, on a very quiet street and which is, you know, obviously still going to be more sensory input than inside on the trainer, but then letting my brain very slowly and carefully receive that new input and process that and then take action with that processed information. So it's super important that we take into consideration how our brain and our body has to respond to all of that information. So when we're riding on a quiet road, you know, of course there's still sensory input coming in, but our brain doesn't have to make our body respond to that so quickly. And so even in that, that's easier on the brain. So I think I'm going to leave that there. Um, all good stuff to think about if you're a big brain nerd. Um, like I am. I was a brain nerd even before I got my concussion. I actually did, I participated in neuroscience research as an undergrad, um, <laughs> coincidentally researching the effects of exercise on learning and memory. Um, before going into physical therapy school to then learn how to teach people about their nervous system and their brain as it relates to movement. 
So I've always been a pretty big nerd about neuroscience and all of that. So yeah, kind of ironic that now I'm learning it from a totally different perspective as somebody going through um, brain issues. But we get what we get, and it's definitely driven me to learn even more about the brain and about healing the brain and about neuroplasticity than I did before. And, you know, there's only so much that education can teach you. And while I certainly would not choose to have a brain injury, um, there is definitely a lot to be gained from personal experience and putting the education that I have actually into practice on myself. So... All right, uh, post in the comments if you have any questions. I hope that made sense. This is the first time I've tried to do a just kind of free form video since my accident. Um, and I know that I do have a tendency to get off track a little bit and kind of jump around. So apologies if this was not super cohesive, but hopefully um, you learned a little bit about the brain or your brain or your brain injury or uh, sensory input, neuromuscular education, um, whether or not it applies to you. Um, I bet if you've gotten this far, you probably are somebody who has a concussion um, or post-concussive syndrome, um, or you're just a big nerd. <laughs> it's all right. If you're a big nerd, I'm right there with you. All right. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Let me know if you have any questions, and thanks for riding along in the passenger seat of Susie Blue here. Have a great day.